Hello, my name is Dr. Jan Erechka. I'm an associate professor from Duquesne University, and today I'm going to talk with you about how to interpret phylogenetic trees. Now, uh, this is a topic that was requested in uh, the comment section of one of my videos, how to make a tree and bootstrap it in Mega. And so if you're interested in the actually mechanics of how to create a tree, I encourage you to check out that video. So the sequence file that we're going to use today and the tree that we're going to look at appears in figure S2 in the supplementary material. Now, I also posted the sequence alignment file, uh, the tree session, as well as the phylogenetic trees that I'm going to be working with today on a repository in GitHub, right? So if you want, you can go to that GitHub repository, download those files, and reconstruct that same tree, uh, and also you know, play around with it and see if you potentially can get the same one uh, that I get here and also that I got in the paper. Now, I do want to caution that the tree isn't going to be completely identical in terms of bootstrap support values and so forth because the tree in the paper was reconstructed using maximum likelihood in pulp. And so the, the model is a little bit different. You know, the software, you know, the, the trees it makes is going to be just a little bit different. There's a lot of consistency. But for example, the bootstrap support values are not going to be identical, even though they're very similar and very comparable. Okay, so that you um, can actually, you know, open up that same tree and same alignment, I'm going to show you how to open up the alignment as well as the tree in Mega. And if you want to do this yourself. So go to Edit Build Alignment, Retrieve a Sequence File from a File. You know, click that uh, Kalugo MTDNA no HSA v2 fast to file, right? That opened up our alignment. Now, just so you know a little bit about the sequences we're working with, this is a mitochondrial concatenated sequence file, right? So that means there's two disjointed sequence segments that got put together in this file. So the first 371 base pairs are 12 S sequences, and then the last, um, you know, from 372 to the end are cytochrome B sequences. Now to open up a previously analyzed tree, you know, I'm gonna open it up as a tree session. You know, so you basically would go to this tree tab and then open tree session and then open up that dot mtsx file, right? You can also open up the NUIC file as well, right? But then you won't get the sequence caption. Now when it opens it up, Notice that um, the whole thing, you, you don't see the scale bar, right? But it's mostly in there. Now, if you want to resize this tree to better fit the window for the tree viewer, then you can hit this button right here, right? And it's going to basically fill that in. Now, it was hard to tell what it actually did. Let me redo it like this. So let's, let's make this window a little bit smaller. Now hit this resize button, and so you see that it resizes it for the window that you're looking at, right? And so there's basically two types of information that are portrayed in a phylogenetic tree. Remember, a phylogenetic tree is a, um, it's a diagram of the evolutionary relationships of the sequences or the organisms that you're looking at, right? Those sequences are represented as what, in what's called tips of the tree. And so, for example, this little tip right here on the right is a tip that represents the sequence from the sample GVAB, which, which is from Borneo, or was sampled in Borneo, right? Now, these tips are then connected by a horizontal line and a vertical line to a node. So the node clusters together other tips and clades that are connected and that are most similar in terms of their sequence, right? And so this node here clustered together the Borneo sample and then the samples from the Malay Peninsula, GVA2, GVA3, GVA1, right? And so basically the node, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide the bootstrap support values for now, and I'm going to add 
the node ID, so, so that as we talk, I can highlight which specific node I'm talking about. So the node 13 groups together the tip GVAB Borneo with the node 12, and the node 12 subsequently groups, you know, those two tips and, and then this third tip right here, right? And so basically everything to the right of node 13 are the descendants of that node. Because remember, a phylogenetic tree assumes common ancestry, right? Basically, in a phylogenetic tree, you're assuming that things are evolving from the nodes. And so basically, the, the tips under, or that descend from that node are the descendants of that common ancestor, right? So that's a very important thing. So in a phylogenetic tree, you assume that these are all related together, right? In contrast, a dendrogram is simply a tree that groups together things that are similar, and there's no assumption as to whether or not they're, relate, they're really related or not. Phylogenetic tree, it assumes homology, and it assumes that the nodes are the common ancestors of all the descendants, right? And those could be uh, clades or tips, right? And so basically a clade, if it's monophyletic, is a group of, 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 of sequences or individuals that are descended from the same node or from a common ancestor. Right now, the other, other piece of information, I'm going to switch back to the bootstrap support values now on these nodes. The other piece of information is the sequence divergence or level of sequence divergence between the sequences at the tips and also the internal nodes, right? And so the amount of sequence divergence is proportional to the horizontal branch length, okay? Now, the horizontal branch length has a scale bar, and again, a tree should always have a scale bar, right? If you see a phylogenetic tree in a paper that does not have bootstrap support values or a scale bar, that's a big faux pas. They should not have let that in there, okay? The reviewers should always insist that phylogenetic trees have scale bars and bootstrap support values, kind of like on a map, you always have, you know, scale bar for the distance and also a north arrow, right? You have to have them, right? So, so basically this horizontal branch length is representing the distance between the, the tip and then whatever other tip that it's, you know, connected to. So for example, uh, notice that GVA4, GVA5, GVA6, they're connected at a node, but there's no horizontal branch. Well, that means that GVA4, GVA5, GVA6 have no sequence differences. And it, as a matter of fact, those sequences are identical. They're the same haplotype, right? Now, the, di the genetic distance or amount of mutations that have accumulated between these Javan samples and between, let's say, Borneo is basically going to be a sum of this horizontal branch right here, then this horizontal branch right here, and then this horizontal branch right here, right? So that, that is basically, again, those horizontal branches represent the amount of sequence divergence uh, between those tips through those nodes, right? Now, the other thing to keep in mind is if you have a uh, tree that is visualized in this horizontal pattern, right? So you have the internal node on the left and then tips on the right, then the vertical branches don't actually mean anything, right? They're not proportional to any kind of distance and they don't mean anything in terms of similarity. So for example, if we were to squish this tree and resize it, notice that the vertical branches become smaller, right? But it still doesn't change the difference or the relationships or what's visualized in the tree, but the horizontal branches are, you know, proportionately the same, right? And another thing to keep in mind is you can also rotate these nodes and the, also the topology doesn't change or the, the information that's in there doesn't change. So if we click on a node here and then we spin it with this little tab here, Flip the selected subtree. Notice all of a sudden the Borneo sample ends up on top, and the Malay Peninsula group or clade is now visually closer to the Java group, right? However, if we follow the nodes, you know we still see that the Bornean, the Bornean sequence 
is more similar to Malay Peninsula sequences than it is to Java, right? Even though it's up here. Now, if we were to publish this tree like this, it would also not be a good way to portray it because basically you want to have your tree oriented in a way that makes sense and is consistent with the evolution of the sequences, right? So we basically would want to rotate this subtree or sub branch or this branch so that it consistently shows the ladder like progression of or the branching patterns of the way that these sequences are actually evolving, right, and changing. Uh, the last uh, couple things that I want to mention is one is, is that you can change the root of the tree. So the root is basically the basal split that separated the most divergent sequence from everybody else, right? So it's, it's basically the, the out group, right? So the, the, the root is connecting the, the more similar sequences to what's referred to as an out group, which is the most evolutionarily distant uh, organism or sequence in there, right? Now we can change the rooting, and again, it's not going to really alter the topology. So, for example, if we root the tree on, on uh, the Bornean sample, now all of a sudden, you know, it kind of looks like the ones from the Philippines is supposed. It's kind of clustering with Java, right? However, um, it it's potentially uh, showing a. You know, basically, this would lead to, I, I could put it, this would really lead to a, um, uh, maybe a misrepresentation or a misinterpretation of the tree that's basically these Java samples should be clustering with the Philippine Kalugos, right? Now, we can, so again, you basically want to be rooting the tree either on the out group or what's referred to as a midpoint, right? So if we go to view, we can change the rooting to root on midpoint, right? And it's going to basically place it in the midpoint of the tree in terms of the branch lengths, right? Now, notice that the midpoint root in this case is the same as if we rooted it on... Uh, well, so the, the inside group is the same as if we root on the Philippines. However, it alters where the actual root is drawn, right? And so this also makes it look kind of odd Right, and so we, we actually, in this particular case, the best way to really show the tree is with the midpoint root instead of rooting it on the out group, right? Because that, that tree is a, is a little bit more balanced, right? So I'm gonna change the view to root on midpoint, right? And so that makes it nice and even. And then again, I'm gonna rotate this branch with the Borneo uh, so that um, it has a nice even cluster. Now, the other thing that, when you're visually showing trees or trying to display trees for a publication or a uh, paper, other thing to keep in mind is, is it's good to rotate the branches so that as like basically the shorter branches are on top, the horizontal branches, and then the longer ones start towards the bottom, right? So, so what I mean is right here, when we change the, the way the tree look, notice that it put the GVA one on top. But it looks kind of odd, right, where you have basically this short internal branch, these horizontal branches, and then a longer one up here. And so it just doesn't look balanced, right? So if we rotate that uh, section again, that branch, now it has a nice even pattern, right? So the last thing I want to mention is how to interpret bootstrap support values, right? So bootstrap support values are basically these... Uh, these um, these values that are very similar to p-values or analogous to p-values in statistical analyses, right? So bootstrap analysis, what happens is that the tree search program, it uh, anal or basically, it, what it does is it um, samples your sequence alignment, right? And it takes a sample of these random positions and it rebuilds the tree. And it does it, you know, however many times you specify. So for example, 100 times. And basically, if that node occurs a hundred times, or I should say, in a in a hundred trees that it rebuilt from this resampled matrix, it does it keeps doing it, you know, reiteratively, right? Then the bootstrap support value is a hundred, and so that means that a hundred different subsamples or random samples of your sequence alignment, all of that supported this particular topology, right? And so that's indicating that there's a lot of consistency in your sequence data 
uh, for that particular clade or group or topological relationship, right? So for example, the GVA4, GVA5, GVA6, those are the same sequences, right? And so no matter how that program resampled that sequence alignment, there was always a, a node that grouped these three together, and that made sense. So that bootstrap support value is 100, right? In contrast, the bootstrap support value for the node that clusters Borneo and puts it together with the sequences from the Malay Peninsula, that has a bootstrap support value of only 31. And so that means there's another 69 trees where Borneo goes somewhere else. Now, in the bootstrap support value analysis, you don't know where the other positions are, although, you know, there's ways you could kind of find those, but, but from this particular number, you don't actually know what the alternative position is. All you know is that only 31 of the times, that's where Borneo ended up, right? And so it actually has a low bootstrap support value. So having said that, there's a possibility that Borneo actually goes with Java and not with Malay Peninsula, right? It's a potential uh, it's a potential uh, relationship that might be present, right? And so how do you deal with that? Well, the thing is, if you have low signal, right, in your data set, the only way that you can further determine what is the correct relationship is if you just either sequence, you know, more genes or more segments, or you sequence longer parts of those genes, right? And eventually, if you sequence enough, you should be able to find high support for a certain particular topology, right? Again, although you do have to take it with a grain of salt because some, some um, basically gene trees can be different from species trees. So the key is that you want to sequence, you know, many different tree, I'm sorry, many different genes and then put them together to look at the overall evolutionary pattern when you're looking at the relationship between different species or different populations. The very last thing that I want to show you is that you also can uh, draw trees in different uh, formats, right? So we can draw a tree as a radiation, right? So this radiation, uh, it actually has the same information, the same nodes, but it's just depicted in a different fashion. And there's advantages and disadvantages, you know, to different ways of looking at a tree. So in this particular case, uh, if you do a radiation, you can clearly see how divergent that CVO Philippines Kalugo is, right? Then uh, next next uh, one that's in, in here is a circle circle uh, tree. Now circle trees, when you have you know a few number of taxa, there's really no point to really making a circle tree, or at least I don't think there is. Um, I mean, there might be in certain situations where you know, based on how your data set is or what you want to try to convey, you might want to make a circle tree. But the circle trees are especially good when you have a lot of taxa where you have a trouble like showing a rectangular tree in a figure, right? So if you have hundreds of sequences or even thousands of sequences, sometimes using a circle tree is the best way to actually show those trees because it's nice and clean and, and it allows you to see the overall pattern very nicely. I'm going to go back to the rectangular tree real quick um, and see here if we, you know, if we, let's see, the, yeah, let, let's go back to the rectangular tree. And the last thing I want to show you is that um, the, the horizontal branch length is not necessarily shown in every tree, right? So in a particular phylogenetic tree, you can choose whether or not you want to show horizontal branch length. And so in mega, you can actually toggle back and forth. So this is the phylogenetic tree that we were looking at where the horizontal branches are proportional to uh, the sequence divergence, right? And again, it's the, the mutations per site or substitutions per site. However, we can also show it where these horizontal branches are not actually proportional to sequence divergence. And the only thing that's portrayed is the topology or basically how these different, or how these different tips and branches are clustering together with the nodes, right? So in this particular case, notice that Java 4, 5, and 6, it's still clustered together, right? But because 
it's drawn such that the horizontal branches are the same across the whole tree and they're not showing any sequence information, you don't actually notice that you know, there is low level of divergence in Java, right? But if we show the branches proportional sequence, now it's really clear, you know, how divergent these different uh, particular sequences are, right? So by having a tree pro with the branches proportional to, which is a horizontal branches, proportional to substitutions per site, it adds an extra layer of information. Okay, so I'm going to end it right there. Uh, I'm going to have, actually, there's one last thing I want to mention is that um, the bootstrap support values show the statistical support for the nodes in the tree, right? But another thing you want to pay attention to is in a tree search, the best tree is, is um, the one that has the highest score. So in a maximum likelihood search, you have the highest score, highest like, log likelihood score for a particular tree, right? And so these tree searches will, will uh, basically search all this different tree space and then they basically keep searching until they stabilize and find the best scoring tree, right? So whenever you publish a tree, you also want to make sure you include the highest likelihood score. Now, if it's maximum likelihood, it would be highest likelihood score. If you're using a, a Bayesian analysis or maximum parsimony, you know, that you'd still give a score, but it would be a different type of score, right? And then you also want to mention what sequence evolution model you used. Uh, in the tree search and, and what the, the model is for the branch lengths. Uh, and again, there, there are in Mega, Mega has a pretty nice tree editor, which is what we're using right now, or they call it a tree explorer. However, there's actually other programs that are better for, you know, changing the way that the trees look. And they are, um, they are designed to increase the sort of the customization of how you want to make the clays look, you can color code the, the different tips, you know, you can modify the font size, and you can also, um, there's basically more options to different ways that the tree is actually portrayed, right? And so one of the ones I like to use is fig tree, and so I'm going to also make a more in-depth video on how to uh, best visualize and show and portray a phylogenetic tree uh, for let's say publications or presentations and so forth, right? So I'm going to try to make that uh, in the next couple of weeks and post that for you as well. So I hope that you found this uh, video useful. And um, again, we covered interpreting trees and the kind of information that um, that is present in them. Thanks a lot.